Hello and welcome to CDA Oasis. My name is Shiraz Desaye. We continue our clinical mentorship series with Dr. Paul Belziki, dental surgeon from Toronto. Dr. Belziki has kindly agreed to share close to four decades of invaluable clinical experience with his Canadian dentist colleagues, and we are grateful to him for doing that. Dr. Belziki, always a pleasure to host you on CDA Oasis, uh, and thank you for your time and efforts with us. Thank you, Shiraz. Nice to be here. So for the benefit of our audience, and before we go and see the presentation, can you tell us what you're going to be talking about today and why is it important? Uh, well, first of all, it's kind of a takeoff on the last presentation and, and this whole theme about doing it old school because I'm an old guy and I talked about amalgam, why I loved it and you should too. And I thought the next thing that should follow was why I love cast, post and course and you should too, because I think it's still an important methodology in the restoration of endodontically treated teeth. And you can't pick up a journal these days or some article on the restoration of endodontically treated teeth. So it is important. Perfect. So shall we go and see the presentation? Yes, let's go. So for those of you that are new to me, let me tell you that I'm a general practitioner and I provide periosurgery, endodontics, and restorative dentistry. And I endeavor to integrate these protocols to deliver long-lasting restorations in terms of decades. And the theme has always been, in these last few posts, is doing it old school. And that's why I love CAS post-cores, and you should too. I use CAS post-cores in anterior teeth that have been endodontically treated. And here you can see the four incisors have been endodontically treated. And that's what they look like uh, clinically. And after you get rid of the decay and the undermined tooth structure, this is what's left. So four cast post cores, custom made, for these, for each individual tooth are inserted. And the tooth, the case was restored with zirconia crowns. So I put this in right at the beginning. So for those of you that think, well, you've got metal underneath, how's that going to affect your aesthetics? Let me tell you that if your lab plans it properly, you can use the opacity the inherent opacity of zirconia, plus other opacifiers to mask that metal and give a very nice aesthetic result. And this is one of them. I will use cast post cores in bicuspids where there's a significant amount of tooth structure that's missing and where the tooth will be subjected to significant stress, as this one will be, and I'll go over this case later. But those of you that have seen other posts I've done, I will also, about 70% of the time, use prefabricated posts and uh, retentive pins with an amalgam core. Very rarely will I use cast post cores in, in molar teeth. Um, just to show you, I've done one. This is way back when. Uh, this cast post core will fit and engage all three of the canals, uh, they're parallel, but the distal one isn't, so you can have one in two pieces, so, you, um, so that will go down a canal that uh, is not parallel. But pretty much exclusively, I will stay with prefabricated metal posts in combination with retentive pins and an amalgam core buildup in molars. So I've been told that cast post cores are not included in some curricula at the university level. And I was told this by one of my patients who's a young dentist, graduated, and I'm helping her treatment plan some cases. And she told me that uh, we weren't taught cast post cores at school. And I thought that was a little bit strange. And uh, I said, well, it would be a good idea in the case we're going to treatment plan. And she says, well, uh, we'd like to use fiber posts because of some flexibility, which to me is a bit of a head scratcher. But uh, I didn't take a word for it, so I started calling a few colleagues at the university level that I have contact with, and indeed, to my surprise, there is controversy on this subject at the university level on the teaching of CAS post course, and it's more so than I would have expected. And these are from educators that I respect. At one end of the country, one person I spoke to says, yes, they still teach it. And he was taught a cast post course when he was a student, and he very much likes them. And another well-respected educator at the other end of the country said, uh-uh, we don't, we don't like them. 
And the arguments for and against seemed compelling on both sides. So how is one to choose? And, and for that matter, how am I to choose? Or, or more importantly, I've made my choice, but how am I to advise as a mentor? And I didn't even think I wanted to touch the subject because I don't like controversy. But I fell back on my own clinical experience, which is extensive. I've employed CAS post cores with very, very little failure. I deem it to be a very elegant and predictable protocol to manage severely broken down teeth, which I plan to show you. Now, is clinical experience a valid path to knowledge? Because everybody says, well, in my hands. Well, I'm saying that too, but I've got about 160,000 clinical photographs of treatment that I provide, and I've kept just about every model and impression that I've taken since 1988 moving to this office. So I think my clinical experience is valid. So can it stand for justification for making some recommendations? So here in 1981, this is my patient, and this is uh, before digital. I've just copied this from ectochrome slides, which I just happen to still have. Uh, took an impression for cast post cores for these two teeth. The lateral and the central were endodontically treated, and I was going to restore these with cast post core and crowns. And this is not of that case, but is one of the few surviving polysulfide rubber impressions I, I still have. And that case, in 1981, I placed two PFM crowns with uh, two cast post cores. And here it is in 2016. That's some 35 years. And it's, she's still my patient and they're still in place. I don't have a freestanding radiograph of just the cast post cores, unfortunately, because they never were a problem, so I didn't take one. But when I had to restore the left central, you can see the right central, and there's the cast post core with the crown still in place. And that's from the lingual aspect. So I do think that I can use clinical experience to make recommendations to other folks, to you folks. Now, it's not just my clinical experience, but those of people I respect. And I'd like to go over this case with you. Here's a crown with a post that's been placed over 40 years ago after the patient fell as a teenager, fractured the tooth, went to a dentist, and had this, I assume this was a cast post core, I didn't know, but I knew it was a metal post, and a crown. And there was absolutely no problem with it other than over the years, his wife started to mention she doesn't like the way that looks. And that's just physiological recession that's taken place over the years, and that root margin's exposed now. So to remove this crown and place a new one, it's important to know if the crown is part of the cast post core, because to remove these crowns, you have to slice down the porcelain, down to the metal coping, if it is a single, a separate crown, and look for that little cement layer and stop. And I couldn't, as, as diligently as I tried to pick up that cement layer, I couldn't. And I thought, well, maybe this is all one piece. So I started milling back and forth, back and forth, removing some of the porcelain and metal. And I, I got to this point on the mesial aspect of the tooth. And then I started on the distal aspect. And then at some point, a thin coping of metal came away. And there you can see it. So I knew... Thankfully, the cast post core was separate. Um, and now it was a matter of just redressing the margin here. But when I took this off, I said, boy, whoever did this did a good job. I mean, that looks great. Um, on the radiograph, I wasn't sure what I was going to find here. But the way this tooth cracked, uh, the margin was clean, uh, no bleeding issues, nothing. And there it is from the lingual. So I did redress the margin, took the impression for a new crown. And I just sat back and I said, this really looks good. And I was wondering, who did this fine work? And he, the, the patient couldn't remember right off the bat. 
but then said the dentist was on St. Clair. And I said, well, I bought my first office at Spadina in St. Clair. And was it, was it uh, Cecil Ampel? And he said, no, it was closer to Young Street. And I said, well, was it at Warren Road? Yes, it was. I said, was it Blake McAdam? And he said, yes, Blake McAdam. Now, I had one of those transcendental moments that you don't often have in, in dentistry at your office, but I've had a few of them. And this was one of them because Blake McAdam was the head of Crown and Bridge Prosthodontics at the University of Toronto, and he was my mentor. Now, I put mentor here in quotation marks because back then, we didn't call them mentors. They didn't know that they were mentors. We weren't shadows. They were just tough, hard-nosed profs that you respected and that you looked towards for guidance. And I wanted to have an to have him as my demonstrator in the clinic because I figured if I could pass his standards, then anything that I would run into in private practice would be a piece of cake. And in one, uh, one of the breaks between, uh, between years in the summertime, he agreed that I could come to his office and watch him work. So I was his dental assistant for about three, four weeks at his office. And there I witnessed firsthand a master. He just didn't make crowns. He made dental jewelry. Everything was just beautiful and perfect. And it went to place and it fit. And if it didn't, he didn't put it in. He, went, he sent it back and things were remade to his high standards. And that's where I learned my craft. And even when I graduated, my office was just down the street from his. And for the first year or so, I would take an impression, run over to his office and show it to him. You know, Dr. McAdam, is this good enough to send away? And he would say, Paul, yes, it is. You're doing well. Brinksmanship. You're doing well. That was his favorite term, was brinksmanship. So here, married in this mouth, on this tooth, is Blake's fine work with the cast post core with my crown. I know it's a little dark. The patient didn't want to go back to the lab. For him, it was just a lot better than how we started. But I got that warm, fuzzy feeling that Blake and I are, are united. So I'll give the gentleman another 40 years. And that's a shared vision of brinksmanship. Now, if I can get 40 years out of a cast post and core, take the crown off, beat that thing up, and then give him another 40 years, for me, this experience renders meaningless all arguments that anything else is superior. I mean, if that was a fiber post or that was some compass of buildup, just getting the original crown off, I would have beat the living daylights out of the core. But that metal cast post course has stood up and continues to stand up over time. Furthermore, some point on flexibility in a post material, I think, is a moot point. And that's why I love cast post cores, and you should too. Or at least consider it as a worthy protocol. So for those of you that are unfamiliar with this technique, you have to get an impression. So you use these plastic dowels, and this is, these are color-coded. This is black, so it corresponds to the number 80 endophile. You need a minimum of a number 80. So the metal's thick enough through the post area to stand up over time. So a number 80, uh, you've got to take your canal at least up to a number 80. It can be bigger, just can't be smaller. And you just cut one off, you put it in some forceps, you must, um, endo forceps, you paint it with, with your adhesive, go back to the tooth, size it to a number 80, go to whatever length you want. I feel very comfortable doing these with hand instruments because I do the endo, so I know what the lengths are. I, I don't like putting rotary instruments into a canal. Um, and then you insert that little dowel, cut it off so that when you put the tray in, it doesn't hit the bottom of that plastic dowel and you retrieve an impression with, with ease. And here you can see there's the impression, the interior of the post. Now I know for the fiber posts or glass posts, whatever you, whatever you call them, whatever their term, I've been told you want the post to fit 
tightly in or intimately in that canal. So now you have to take a drill and size your, your canal to match a post. I would much rather leave the shape of the canal as is, just size it up to a number 80, and then make something to fit the tooth rather than make the tooth fit something. Now, there's the stone model. If you're doing digital, you might as well go get a coffee and leave because if you're doing digital, you can't image the interior of a canal. And I know that some folks have thrown out their impression material, probably along with their amalgamator. I think it's worth keeping on to both the amalgamator and the impression material and the tray material because you never know when you might need something to help you out in a tight situation. You want to just take predominantly digital, no problem. Or not do amalgams all the time, no problem. But at least in those few instances where you might need it to help you out, I don't see why you would close that door. So when they make the cast core, the, the cast post core, it's just not a metal post that comes out that dimension. And then the core goes out to here. Then it will break. What you want to do is engage the downward slope of your preparation. And the concept of ferrule is vitally important and must be attained. That way, and, and if you don't have it, you've got to go looking for it. And sometimes where there's not a lot of tooth material exposed uh, super gingivally, I will incorporate my, the margin of the crown prep and make what I call a cast post and core with a marginal apron. This is the conventional type where the, the margin of the tooth is here. This is not uh, a marginal apron, but you can see the core has a metal skirt that encompasses a good part of that tooth. And there you can see the cast post core in place. Very nice length and it was easy to get that length with this technique and it supports a four unit bridge. Now going back to this idea of flexibility, I, I tried to think this out in my own mind. So let's assume that this fiber or this, uh, that the dowel is the fiber post, just for a moment, that that's going to be cemented in. So you've got your root, you've got a little bit of sealer here, and a little bit extends out of the tooth. And then you're to take composite resin, and you're going to bond that to the post, and you're going to somehow bond it to this little bit of surface area. And I thought to myself, okay, flexibility. If I were to take needle nose hemostats and grab this and wiggle jiggle it any which way I want, nothing's going to happen. You can sit there forever and nothing, nothing will go wrong. If I grab this, with needle nose hemostats and start jiggling, wiggling back and forth, several things can happen. Number one, you can just crack the whole core. It'll start to crumble and break. Or you'll detach it from the surface of the tooth because what does it take to overcome 15 to 20 megapascals of strength? And that's in an ideal situation. So I've just removed it here just for the sake of argument. You can imagine it's still in place. I just got rid of it to make for this animation. But when that happens and you start exposing this tooth to stress, well, yeah, it's going to flex right here, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Cyclically, you will get catastrophic failure. So I see no benefit to the flexure of a post, only negative consequences. So this little animation is really a byproduct of what I've seen clinically. And that's why I hate non-metal posts. And I think you should too. Because glass and resin, whatever they're made of, are not indestructible in the same way metal is. So in this case, this is a patient who travels to visit her daughter here from, from Jordan. And I was seeing her in 2005 for an emergency somewhere else in the mouth. I took the, some radiographs and I saw she had a bridge here. It wasn't the best bridge I'd ever seen with a little metal post there. I did some work somewhere else. She went away and she came back in 2009 with a new bridge and she said something doesn't feel right. And I can see now that metal is now gone and I have what I think is 
some post material, which is not metal. So I put a little probe under the pontic, I gave it a tug, and I could see that the bridge was loose on the cuspid. Cut it off here, and the whole thing just fell into my hand. And here is a live or an actual representation of that little animation that I'd made. This material uh, right at the surface here was fuzzy it, because the fibers are strong, the glass rods are strong, but it's the glue that holds them all together begins to break down with cyclic stressing. And the thing just broke away and part of it was still stuck in the tooth. Sorry, in the, um, in the in interior surface of the, of the retainer. Just past this little bit of fuzziness, yeah, it was rock solid. And that posed a big problem. And there you can see it. How do I restore this tooth and get her back to Jordan in the three or four weeks I had during her vacation? Implants were not possible. She'd had implants, had a bad experience with them, didn't want to go the route of implants. What can you do? So I canceled my day. I phoned up uh, my neighborly endodontist, Dr. Andrew Moncars here in Toronto, who I think is an amazing endodontist. And I said, Drew, you have to help me get this, this post out, make me a post space. So with ultrasonics, with a microscope, he worked diligently to try to follow the lead of this fiber post up a tooth, and that's not an easy thing to do. Yeah, you can, you can try to line it up, put it in, but it's very easy to go off line here, and we did. But thankfully, we did not perforate. So I brought her, I brought her back to my office, and I thought, okay, I, I've got to make a temporary here. So I'm not a fool. I know that this root standalone will break no matter what I do to it, no matter how I restore it. So I am going to double abut it to another tooth. So I prepared the lateral and there's not a lot of tooth structure here to work with. So apically reposition flap, crown lengthening, osseous recontouring, and that's what's done here. And I did that, made a provisional bridge out of my favorite material, old style, methyl methacrylate, powder liquid, because I can add to this an infinite number of times. And it's important in the course of complicated, extensive crown and bridge procedures. So it's cemented in, stitched up, and she came back a few weeks later and the skin started to heal. And at least I could get an impression now. Um, removed it. Here you can see there is the old margin. And I'm going to sink that down a little bit more. This is before I put retraction cord in. And yes, every fraction of a millimeter helps in these badly debilitated, broken down teeth. So I've re-prepared the tooth. I've taken the impression. And now I remove, I can hollow grind uh, this material and just fill it with new, fill it with new methyl methacrylate acrylic and just refine the margin all over again it takes minutes that's why i love this material so at the lab there they made me a cast post core conventionally and i thought i've got a minimal amount of time i don't know what i'm going to use i want to fight for the most security i can so just make me a second one make me a cast post core with a marginal apron that entombs the entire tooth and my superstructure will finish on a margin that's incorporated into the cast post core. I can't recall exactly which one I cemented in. I think I did cement in the one with the marginal apron, but I knew that I would get more recession here and that aesthetics would be an issue. So I may have just trimmed just a hint of the margin away just to get down to tooth structure. And I'm jumping ahead here. I just don't have a radiograph of the cast post core in place with nothing without the superstructure but there's the completed case so we went offline a little bit but it wasn't a catastrophe again once that cast post core is in place i just removed the provisional post hollow ground all three retainers 
did a wash impression with uh, the powdered liquid methyl methacrylate, and then you can trim that, impress the margins, trim it down. This is all done in the office, takes 15, 20 minutes, and reestablish the margin. And then we had to address the right side as well. And here you can see why she wasn't enamored with an implant case. She had this done back, uh, back in her native country and it just did not work out well. Two endos were done here and we wanted to secure these teeth while she was away. So there was some sort of crown material here. I don't know what it was. It certainly wasn't uh, one of the high strength porcelain resins or the porcelains or any of the resins we have now, but it did come away quite easily. And that's all that was left. So I prepared the cuspid as well, and I prepared these for two cast post cores, knowing that I could only really get one in, in the cuspid. This was buried too much and needed periodontal surgery. So I took an impression for a cast post core just in the cuspid, and right after the impression was taken, raised the flap, because that's insufficient feral for anything. And then just started to trim that down. Then I could take a little bit of bone away. So being the restorative dentist and providing the perio, first of all, it makes you far more respectful of both procedures, both your restorative endeavor and the perio. But doing this, you come to respect soft tissue a whole lot more because you know what it took to make it pink and beautiful at the final phase. So you treat the tissue a lot more delicately. So here I've trimmed the, uh, a new margin while the flap was open, and then fabricate two provisional posts. This is just wire pins, just something simple and flexible, methyl methacrylate, powder liquid, and the case was cemented in. And a post came back within a week. I removed uh, the, the temps and the sutures, which is that little bit of redness there. You can see we're starting to get preliminary, preliminary, preliminary healing and insert the cast post core in the cuspid and then re-mill the provisional, cemented that in. So now I know she can go back to Jordan with security. I've got a good cast post core with an almost marginal apron in the cuspid. I've got a good cuspid here, and these provisionals will hold up quite nicely, and they were cemented in with poly F cement, so they're going nowhere. And after six months, she, she returned. This little bit of fuzziness is just some alginate. I take the photograph after the alginate impression. And now talks went towards I want, if you're fixing up these teeth and these teeth, can we also fix up the remaining three? And that was a good decision. So going back, I needed to address the one four that had healed and I've got an impression now. And I was able with this technique to engage both canals. They were pretty much parallel and that's, that was returned to me. And it does have a marginal apron and it was cemented in place. Now I know, in my mind, beyond a shadow of a doubt, this 1-4 is secure. It's going nowhere. I can put whatever I want on this restoration. That tooth is, is totally secure. Because it's going to be restored with three splinted crowns. Because with splinted teeth, I know I can help prevent root fracture. These, these, after all, these are endodontically treated teeth. So I've double, I've triple abutted lateral cuspid and bicuspid on the right side. And on the left side, that was the tooth with the cast post core. And I've triple abutted in the anterior because I was going to put crowns on the front teeth anyways. Why not just join it for extra strength? And there's the completed case. There was one, three, one by three splint here then from the left central back, and she had a standalone right central. And that's how the case was, was restored. So cast post cores with marginal aprons provide excellent strength and durability over the long term. Because both she and I did not want to have to do this again. She'd already had multiple restorations on these teeth. And I know that 
I've got security on these teeth. If the canals diverge, as they did in this case, something elegant to do is make a cast post core, one section here, and then you'll have a second section that goes through a hole in the top of the core. And there you can see it. So one section is cemented in and at the same time, all the cement has to be wet. At the same time, you drive in the other post in its direction, and then you just saw the little knob off. And that case was restored with two fused crowns, two splinted crowns. So just to show you more, more demanding situations where cast post cores have helped me out was this case. 2008, this patient came to me. Uh, the chief complaint, I'm unhappy with the little gap that's opened up here. This work was done by another dentist. Uh, it was not, I don't think it was, um, uh, I think this may have been Sirac. I'm not sure. She spent 10 hours in, or 10, 12 hours in his office, she told me. I don't have a reason to not believe her. But I took a look at the radiograph and I thought, do I really want to start replacing crowns on, these, uh, on this case where, where we have multiple problems, short roots, root end procedures, amalgam. I mean, uh, I, I, I had lengthy discussions with her and I said, I'm uncertain about the long-term prognosis of these teeth. Eventually, you may have to lose them and go to implants where aesthetics is challenging, can be a problem. So if we have a choice, let's leave the area alone until we have no choice. A year later, I had no choice. She came in and the prefabricated post and crown that was in the left lateral dislodged. And there's minimal tooth structure here. So we had the exact same discussion. And I said, let's try to just keep this thing going. You're, you're in your 40s. Let's try to put off implants for as long as we can. So I took an impression for a cast post score, again, with a marginal apron. And here you can see how little is left. Cast post core, marginal apron, in gold. Gold seems to not give that grayness that a silver colored alloy would give. So in these anterior cases, I will use a high yellow gold. And you can see that metal skirt will encompass ferrule down to the margin. And it was cemented in. And all I did was take a little diamond and just dust off a little bit of metal here just so I could finish my tooth my crown on tooth structure. Just feathered it down just as minimally as possible. And there's the final result. And you can see there's a big wad of metal here, yet it can be masked effectively with zirconia. And she was quite thrilled. So again, long-term prognosis of the remaining incisors is uncertain. Patient didn't want an implant case, again, for, for the difficulty of getting good aesthetics. And she agreed that maintaining the incisors until she had no choice was indeed the best choice. That was 2009. Well, in 2015, I had no choice again. She walked in with this photograph. She tripped on this sidewalk, smacked her face. And this is a week or two, some healing had occurred. She didn't come in right away. And you can see she'd lost the right lateral, cracked the lingual of the left central. That tooth was a little bit mobile, but that little cast post core with that little zirconia crown is still in place, rock solid, to my surprise. So how this case was restored, I told her, I don't know where this is going. Let's disassemble it and we'll see what we can keep and then go from there. I removed the centrals because they were so short and you can see here, that's just the apical end of them. But that little cast post core, once healing had occurred after the extractions, a little bit more tooth structure was exposed. So I was able to feather that down a little bit and the case was restored with an anterior bridge, triple abutting these three teeth, and double abutting 
the lateral and cuspid on the other side. Patient was never without teeth. We talked about implants. I said, let's try, try it this way. Implants will always be there for you if you need them. Go as long as you can without. So that case is still in, in place. Here's another one. Um, this tooth has dislodged. It, it was loose and it was endodontically treated. You can see it's starting to come loose. And I just removed it with finger pressure and it had a prefabricated post attached to a composite core. And that was a radiograph. And I could see it was offline, didn't follow the canal. So I really didn't want to re-cement it. And the marginal fit was poor. So here you can see that's where the canal, sorry, that's where the post is or was, and that's where it should be. I'll just toggle back and forth. And a good part of that is a result of sticking a rotary instrument in there without maybe softening the gutta percha first, so to try to stay within the confines of your canal. So it's easy to, 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 to go astray. And I wanted to put the post where it should be, so I just flooded this tooth with some um, poly F cement. It goes through a doughy stage slowly, and I just took an instrument and went round and round and round and generated a post space. Took an impression. And there's the study model. And in this case, this one would be a cast post core with a crown all in one piece. And the reason I decided on this was that there was not a lot of tooth material left. Um, it was a short clinical crown and it was a very deep bite. And I didn't think I'd be able to make an effective cast post core and a separate crown. There just wasn't enough room. So I elected to go all in one. And there you can see the lingual surface was going to be in metal. That's how much was left. inserted in the mouth. All the adjustments were made to the occlusion and then porcelain was processed. And that was inserted in 2004. And here it is in 2017. So that's given 13 years of service. Could it crack and break? Sure. It's given them 13 years that we didn't subject an implant to stresses and strains because those aren't forever either. I know because I've got one just like that in my mouth and know what it takes to, to make it right and put it in. So after 13 years, still going strong, and you can see how I've redirected the post. And then when he came back, I just took out the polycarboxylate cement that was in there with a the Cavitron, then flooded the whole thing with new cement, and, I, and uh, the, the cement I use is old style poly F polycarboxylate cement or Ketac powder liquid, either one is good. So after 13 years, yeah, I love cast post cores. They can be used creatively to solve unique and demanding clinical situations where other materials and methods will just not hold up over time. You need to con control the endodontic phase, enlarge the canal space to a minimum number 80 and don't transport the canal. And you can use any castable metal alloy. With zirconia in the interior, you need to guide the lab on the adequate thickness of the core material and opaquer to block out the metal. And where possible with multiple units, consider splinting. Now as a final demanding case, this patient presents with pain from the lower anteriors. Now, I had done this restoration in 2009, sorry, in 2000, and this was some 10 years later. He's the type of patient where you, he only comes in when there are symptoms, fix me up, send me away, and I won't see you till something bothers me again. Well-educated man, has funds, just this is, his, this is his personality. And there's no wonder he's in pain he's worn through down to the pulp chambers. And he has done so on some of the other teeth in the past um, where I've done endodontic therapy. But he 
just puts things off until he, he, he can no longer do so. So here you can see the wear that's taken place, the endodontic therapy that I've done in the past. And I saw him in 2000 when I did the upper reconstruction and walks in 2009. And yes, I told him about a lack of posterior support, getting in a partial or doing implants, just doesn't care to have anything done. So you can see the destruction that's taken place and how he's chipped and worn away the porcelain in the upper bridge. So the treatment plan was to deal with the pain and in this case endodontics for the four incisors. I needed to provide provisionals to reestablish form and function during the restorative endeavor. I need to open up the bite and provide guidance for the lab. I have to provide cast post course for each tooth to restore them. The final restoration plan for splinted crowns of all nine teeth to, forget to guard against future root fracture. And the, pra the patient obviously has a bruxing habit and then to provide an appliance to deal with that bruxism. So in the first appointment, I want to do my endos and temps. So took a sandpaper disc and just tried to smooth these off as best as I could. And then started with my endodontic therapy. Now you have to be fairly confident in your endo protocol. And in some of these small teeth, yes, there were two canals. Quite challenging. Um, and there you can see I've completed and took a little bit of temp bond and just put it in the holes just to close up the voids and then make my provisionals. I took the stone model, started adding a little bit of, of the um, light cured blue blockout material and spent about 15, 10, 15 minutes generating what I thought was proper looking anatomy for lower anteriors, and then spent about an hour making one out of methyl methacrylate powder liquid, and there it is inserted in the mouth. So that was the first appointment, and he walked in one way and walks out quite another, and these things are quite gratifying and satisfying for both myself and the patient. But it did take five hours to accomplish. I mean, doing the endos, preparing the teeth, Making the provisionals, these are long, tiring appointments. So on the second appointment, I worked up each canal to a number 80 by hand, put those little plastic dowels in, picked up an impression, four on one side, four on the other. Case was returned from the lab. And you can see each one has a core with a skirt that encompasses that all important ferrule on each tooth. I split the acrylic temps because it's easy to patch it at the end of the appointment to reattach it because as I said a million times, methyl methacrylate, you can join it to itself, it adds to itself. But I just wanted to make sure, was the anatomy within the confines of the planned anatomy, like would this core allow for the anatomy of the final case. And it needed a little bit of trimming off the lingual and a little bit off the, off the top. And all those small adjustments are done one by one. And then you hollow grind the provisionals and just take a wash impression with new acrylic. Did that for the entire bunch of teeth. And there you can see it radiographically. Everything's well controlled. Nothing is blown out, um, made to measure, made to measure posts. Impression was taken, and you can see um, it's accurate, no defects. Because I'm going for long-term survivability. I have to make sure that I get this as perfect as possible because the patient deserves it. That's what we would want if we're on the receiving end of treatment. And then hollow grind and remake the same provisionals. There you can see taking into account adequate embrasure space so he can get in between at night at home. And the cases, uh, the provisionals were cemented in. Splinted crowns. 
I have all splinted crowns, even if it's just two. They all come back in single units because it's important for me to fit each one on each tooth to assure that that one fits accurately and passively to my liking. And built in are surfaces for soldering. Doing it old school, try in each coping, make sure it fits, then start looting them together with the same with the same uh, provisional acrylic that I make the provisional crowns out of. And there you can see they're all joined together. So now each one sits on the tooth passively and I've joined it together. So they're all related accurately as it sits in the mouth, because invariably it's different than as it sits in the master model, as I'll show you. So there's the framework. A second set of pin dies is provided and you just lock it in with a bit of sticky wax. Sorry, I didn't have my glove on. I didn't think I was going to ever show this, but I've, uh, I've attached the sticky wax here and just plop that into some stone. And what, once it's hardened and you remove the bridge, you've made what's called a solder jig. And this is all important because if it fits this, it will fit the mouth. If I take those splinted, units and put it back on the master model that they were made on, you can see it doesn't go to place, nor would I expect it to. Because there's always, whether it's done by computer, whether it's done by a human, there's always a little bit of a difference. I want to know how all of these are related to each other while they're sitting on the teeth, not on a master model. So that's why we solder jig them. And the case is soldered. You need a good lab technician and they're getting harder and harder to find because the whole world is going digital. And now I don't know if you can generate these sorts of delicate embrasure spaces, but I know I can do this with carborundum discs and the lab can do it. And when I get the separate units back, I can address those areas before the case is soldered. So there's a lot of planning that goes into this case. Yes, I did get a little bit of recession here, but I knew he wouldn't worry about it, and so I didn't either. So this technique will predictably result in accurate fitting restorations where multiple units are splinted together. But as I said, you have to have an expert lab technician that knows what he's doing. Tried in the soldered framework, and it fit very nicely. Put a little button of acrylic on the surface so I could establish a bite registration in the mouth. Warmed up some wax. And I do have a Bunsen burner in the office. Warm up some wax, take a wax bite. I mounted it on an articulator and it's returned from the lab. Now I know before this goes into his mouth, it's going to fit. I could never go from impression to final case and I never have in one go. I just don't think it's possible. And yes, there's a fine metal margin because that's the best way for me to control the fit. I'm going for long-term survivability. And the embrasure spaces are all handled in such a manner that the patient can clean in between and my hygienist can clean for him as well. So the day of insertion, there's no surprises. It fits the solder jig, it fits the mouth. There it is from the lingual. So conventional time-honored techniques will result in the delivery of long-lasting restorations. Dentistry is the fabrication of functional art that must survive in a very harsh environment. And there's not one more harsh than this one. And it's truly engineering in miniature. And engineering is reaching the best compromise of materials and methods to solve a problem with a specified set of criteria. And in this case, it's the restoration of severely broken down teeth with a prosthesis that will last the patient's entire life. Now, I don't know whether it will or won't, but I got to give it my best shot because how many times can you do this to a person? How many times can you do this to teeth? So I have to sacrifice some aesthetic criteria, in this case, it's the fine metal margin, 
in order to satisfy the more important criteria of long-term survivability. I've locked down the margins and I've locked the teeth down with, with splinted units. So recommendations are not decided upon in a vacuum, like the recommendations I'm making. It's based on my clinical experience that is very long. And here is a case in 2003. I built on the knowledge gained in 2000, sorry, in 1983, I built on the knowledge of a past case in order to deliver on a present case. But it's the same idea, impression, after I cemented the cores in, and this is, was done by my first lab technician of 25 years, Gabriel Pintos. I mean, this is wonderful. I don't know if you could get a machine to middle it any better. These are three splinted units that survive the, the, the patient's life. So it's not just the clinical experience of my hands, but it's Blake McAdam, Phil Watson, University of Toronto. I've had the pleasure of hearing Terry Donovan and, and the late Ralph Udalis, who was the Imperial Prosthetics at the University of Washington. So when I hear let's say posts aren't as good, the failure rate. I need to know how was the endodontics carried out? Who did it? Because that's important. I want to know who did the restorative work. How accurate were their impressions? How was the core designed? Did it have feral? And what was the final restorative endeavor? How exacting was their entire process? I go back to this slide of Dr. Ursula Franklin, she was head of the Department of Material Sciences, University of Toronto, the engineering department, and that department works in concert on material sciences with the dental department. And as I told the story in around 2003, 2004, I was advised by an academic at the, at the faculty to use a new, a new cement resin modified glass ionomer, uh, glass ionomer cement. And I went to it and after a few years, things were failing. And supposedly on paper, this was better than anything else. And I questioned uh, Dr. Franklin on it. And she said the following, take all that complicated chemistry, put it into, put it on the paper, mix it up, put it in the crown and then put that crown in the environment of the mouth, on my tooth. There you are, these are her words, on the chemical high wire without a net. Nature has an insidious way of undoing anything man-made in ways not possibly replicated in the research lab. So when I hear like uh, so-and-so cement or so-and-so last five years, I can make chopped liver last five years in the mouth. I wanna know in terms of decades. And she went on to tell me, as a careful clinician, you must hold your everyday experience in higher esteem than that reported in journals from academics and most certainly from manufacturers. She called this knowledge of and by the hand. And she said, endeavor to share your knowledge with younger clinicians. And she told me this when I drove her home one night after an appointment, and it just stuck with me. So again, um, all the effort, it's to honor her memory. And I, and I have, I've been trying to follow her advice. I present all the cases. I know this was a lengthy one, but I provide a lot of photographic evidence that I may be judged the careful clinician. Further, I have to tell you, I have a pathological fear of failure. I won't pursue something. I wouldn't use cast post decors if they failed. And from Blake McAdam, from my father, from, from all the other hard-nosed clinicians I've worked with, it's the concept of brinksmanship is ever-present. So in closing, which post to use? To tell you quite honestly, I don't feel a need to convert anybody to my mindset. When I hear people say at conventions, oh, I'm a panky man or I'm a Dawson man, to my mind, that means you're just not thinking for yourself. I don't want anybody to be a Belziki man. You have to take in knowledge where you can find it and then assemble it to suit your own sentiment. 
So I don't have any, I don't have a need for anybody to follow me because I really don't have a dog in the fight, as the saying goes. But more correctly, I do have a dog. And it's a very good one. And it's an obedient one. We just don't have a need to fight. The best we can do is to establish a viewpoint in a meaningful and hopefully respectful manner with evidence that I think is compelling to at least consider the use of cast post cores in those situations where strength and security are paramount and maybe to teach it in the curriculum so that the young kids can be safe and be cool doing it old school. And I thank you listeners very, very much.